Nurses are usually responsible for assessing the newborn to determine the gestational age of the baby. This examination is done as soon after birth as possible. During pregnancy, the fetus develops in an orderly, predictable manner. The most reliable estimation of gestational age, the number of weeks from conception to birth, is comprised of two components, physical characteristics and neuromuscular maturity. It is important because infants born before or after term and whose size is not appropriate for gestational age could be at risk for complications. A radiant warmer provides heat for the infant and adequate light for the examination. The infant should be examined in the presence of its parents and a full explanation given to them of the findings. Different gestational age scoring systems are used to provide a systematic method of examining the infant and to document findings. These are called the Dubowitz Ballard Scale or the Ballard Scale. Information from the gestational assessment of the infant is compared with descriptions printed on the assessment tool and the squares marked which most nearly match the assessment findings. It is also important to assess if the neonate is small, large, or appropriate for gestational age. The assessment is best carried out within 12 hours of birth if the neonate is thought to be less than 26 weeks gestation. If over 25 weeks, the evaluation may be done within the first 96 hours. Agency policy may dictate the screening be done twice by two independent examiners to ensure objectivity. To begin the assessment, don gloves until the infant has been bathed and all traces of blood, amniotic fluid, or body secretions have been removed. Begin your evaluation of physical characteristics by inspecting the skin for color, opacity, and texture. Assess the skin for color first. Color of a term infant skin may be pale and range from pink to mottled to cyanotic in the extremities. The skin appears opaque because of the subcutaneous fat gained during the last weeks of pregnancy. A few indistinct vessels may be visible on the abdomen. The skin may also appear slightly dry, with superficial peeling around the feet, ankles, and hands. Note the amount and location of vernix, a whitish cheese-like substance that covers and lubricates the skin of the fetus in utero. Vernix gradually disappears as pregnancy progresses and by term is present only in deep creases of the body. Because of less time to gain subcutaneous fat, the skin of preterm infants often appears thin and transparent. Numerous blood vessels may be visible. In post-term infants, those born after 42 weeks of gestation, peeling of the skin is common. The skin appears dry and leathery with deep cracks. This is due to the decrease in the amount of vernix on the skin. Also, peeling becomes more visible hours after birth as the skin loses moisture. Superficial vessels are not visible. Nails may be long, often extending past the ends of the fingers. Post-term infants may have green meconium staining of their skin and nails. These infants have often passed meconium stool into the amniotic fluid for a significant period of time prior to delivery, resulting in the discoloration. Lanugo, fine hair that covers the fetus in utero, gradually thins as gestational age increases. In term infants, lanugo is generally present only on the shoulders and upper back. Lanugo may be abundant on preterm infants and is usually absent from those who are post-term infants. The presence or absence of lanugo, however, is not always a reliable indication of gestational age. Newborns with dark coloring may have more lanugo than infants with fair skin, even though they are the same gestational age. As the fetus grows at approximately 32 weeks gestation, plantar creases begin to develop on the soles of the feet and spread downward toward the heel. By 40 weeks, the entire surface of the foot is covered by deep creases. It's important to know that these creases are considered an invalid measure beyond 12 hours after birth. As the skin of the foot begins to dry, superficial creases that are not related to gestational age begin to appear. Preterm infants have fewer plantar creases. However, by 37 weeks, faint creases can be seen and may cover the anterior two-thirds of the foot. 
deep creases cover the entire sole of the post-term infant's foot. Breast tissue develops gradually in the last few weeks of gestation. By term, the areola is raised and the nipple is well defined. The breast buds measure approximately 5 to 10 millimeters. Determine size by placing a finger on either side of the breast bud and measuring the diameter in millimeters. Do not pinch or lift the tissue between the thumb and forefinger. This action can result in an inaccurate measurement. The areola of preterm infants is flat and smooth and there is less than 1 to 2 millimeters of palpable breast tissue or none at all. The areola of a post-term infant resembles that of a full-term infant. The new Ballard score has been expanded to assess for fusion of the eyelids in extremely premature infants. The eyelids are fused until 26 to 28 weeks of gestation. Loosely fused eyelids can be opened by gentle traction. Tightly fused eyelids cannot. Ear form and cartilage distribution also develop with gestational age. Cartilage gives the ear its shape and substance. By term, the newborn's ear is firm and stands away from the head. There is a well-defined curvature of the entire pinna and the ear springs back quickly when it is folded against the head. In a preterm neonate, the ear is relatively shapeless and flat because it has little cartilage. At 32 weeks gestation, when the ear is folded, it remains folded or springs back slowly. This is called recoil. However, there may be slight incurving of the upper pinna by 36 weeks. Assessing genital development is also important. Male genitals are evaluated for the size of the scrotal sac, the presence of rugae or folds, and descent of the testes. The scrotum of the term infant is pendulous with deep rugae, and the testes are generally in the lower scrotum. Testes are located by palpating from front to back with a thumb and forefinger. Another finger may be placed over the inguinal canal to hold the testes in place. In comparison, the scrotum of a preterm infant is small and the testes are not descended. By 36 weeks, the scrotum is more developed with the testes in the upper scrotal sac. In post-term infant, the testes are pendulous and the scrotal sac contains deep rugae. With term female infants, the labia majora cover or almost cover the labia minora and clitoris. Because the size of the labia majora is affected by the amount of subcutaneous fat, the genitalia of poorly nourished infants may appear immature. In contrast, the labia majora of preterm infants are small and widely separated, and the labia minora and clitoris are prominent. With post-term infants, the labia majora covers the clitoris and the labia minora. Neuromuscular tone and degree of flexion is the other component used to determine gestational age because the neurological system of the fetus matures at a fairly constant rate. Because other factors such as illness or acidosis affect the neurological functioning, this part of the assessment may be delayed for several hours until the infant's condition has stabilized. In critically ill infants where neuromuscular assessment is not possible, the physical scores may be doubled to obtain an approximate Dubowitz score. Neuromuscular assessment is affected significantly by sedation as well as the illness itself. To evaluate gestational age by posture and the degree of flexion, first place the infant in a supine position. The arms, knees, and hips of a healthy term infant are fully flexed. In contrast, infants who are preterm lack sufficient muscle tone to keep the extremities flexed and will have limp, partially extended arms and legs that offer little resistance to movement. Also note the frog-like posture of the post-term infant. To elicit the square window sign, a measure of joint and cartilage flexibility, exert gentle pressure using a thumb and forefinger to flex the hand toward the forearm. Measure the angle formed at the wrist. To avoid injury, do not rotate the infant's wrist during this part of the exam. 
Generally, there should be no difficulty flexing the wrist of a term infant until the hand lies almost directly against the forearm. In preterm infants, as in adults, less flexion is possible because joints and cartilage are more firm. The palm bends only to 90 degrees and resembles a square window. Post-term infant's wrist flexion is the same as a term infant. Assess arm recoil to determine the degree of flexion. To test arm recoil, flex both arms down at the elbows simultaneously and hold in a flex position for 5 seconds. Then fully extend the arms and quickly release them. In a healthy term infant, the arm should return promptly to full flexion. A sluggish recoil or partial flexing when the hands are released suggests that the infant is preterm. Post-term infant's recoil is the same as the term infant's. Measure the popliteal angle to determine the degree of knee flexion. To avoid injury and inaccurate data, this procedure should be omitted or delayed if the infant was in a breech presentation. During this maneuver, flex one thigh on the abdomen and hold it in its position. Place the index finger of the other hand behind the neonate's ankle and exert gentle pressure to extend the lower leg. Stop applying pressure when resistance is met. Measure the angle formed at the knee. Results vary from resistance that creates a 90 degree angle in term and post-term infants to very little or no resistance in very immature infants. To check for muscle tone, initiate the scarf sign which measures the extent of shoulder flexion. Take the infant's hand and bring the arm across the body to the opposite side, being careful not to lift the infant's shoulder. Note the position of the elbow in relation to the midline of the body. In term and post-term infants, the elbow often fails to reach the midline because of resistance. Before 36 weeks gestation, the preterm infant has little muscle tone. The arm can be wrapped across the body, much like a scarf. This indicates the infant is preterm. To determine heel to ear extension, Place the infant in a supine position and grasp one foot and gently draw it up as near the head as it will go without forcing it. Keep the hips flat on the examining surface and do not allow them to roll up as the leg is lifted. Note the distance from the foot to the ear. Like the assessment of popliteal angle, omit this procedure if the infant was in a breech presentation because of possible injury to the already extended legs and hip joints. Term and post-term infants offer resistance during this maneuver. There is considerable distance between the foot and the ear. In addition to the proximity of the foot to the ear, note the flexion of the knee. Stop flexing when resistance is first felt. If you continue pressure, the newborn may relax the leg. In preterm infants, the leg will remain straight and the foot will extend closer to the ear. As each part of the assessment is performed, the infant's response is matched with the diagrams and descriptions on the assessment tool, and corresponding numbers for each assessment are assigned. When you have completed assessing both physical characteristics and neuromuscular maturity, total the scores from your notes on the assessment tool. This total score determines the best estimation of gestational age. For example, if the infant's total score is 40, he was born at 40 weeks gestation. If the infant's score is 35, the infant was born at 38 weeks gestation. Knowledge of the infant's gestational age compared to this measured score alerts the healthcare team to possible problems associated with either prematurity or post-maturity. A plan of care can be developed which is based on the assessment and the infant can be monitored for these potential problems. Because their organs are immature, preterm infants are more at risk for respiratory distress syndrome, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and hyperbilirubinemia than term infants. Because placental function decreases after 42 weeks, some post-term infants are at risk for hypoglycemia due to nutritional deprivation, meconium aspiration because of intrauterine hypoxia, and polycythemia 
an increase in red blood cells in response to hypoxia. Regardless of gestational age, newborns can experience complications related to growth. If their weight, length, and head circumference fall between the 10th and 90th percentile, they have grown at an appropriate rate and are considered average for gestational age, or AGA. Neonates below the 10th percentile in weight are considered small for gestational age, or SGA. For instance, an infant born at 40 weeks and weighing 2200 grams is term, but small for gestational age. In this case, the expected complications are related not to maturity, but to growth retardation, and include perinatal asphyxia, excessive heat loss, aspiration syndrome, infections that cross the placental barrier, and hypoglycemia. An infant who is 36 weeks gestation and weighs 4,000 grams is preterm, but is also in the 90th percentile for weight. This infant may be subject to the complications related to prematurity, as well as those related to being large for gestational age, or LGA. If the infant is LGA, it may have birth trauma due to the large size. He or she may also require supplemental feedings to prevent hypoglycemia, which is one of the most common complications of infants who are LGA. These infants are often born to diabetic mothers and may have other associated complications. Head circumference, weight, and length are also plotted to determine if the infant's growth was symmetrical. All three parameters, head circumference, weight, and length, should be approximately the same percentile. It is noted that some scales consider only weight and head circumference to determine if growth is symmetrical. Discovering asymmetrical growth may alert the healthcare team to evaluate the infant for possible problems of intrauterine development. Gestational age evaluation permits the healthcare team to identify those infants who are either preterm or postterm and to prepare for complications related to these conditions. Correlation of gestational age with the size of the infant also allows the team to predict and prepare for problems that are related to accelerated or retarded growth. Nurses are usually responsible for assessing the newborn to determine the gestational age of the baby and at comparing gestational age with the infant's size. With practice, the nurse will become proficient and skilled at accurately performing these valuable screening procedures.